Alright, time for another DraftPhysics.com video presentation. Debate physics also, but physics doesn't allow for much debate. And they claim that they're just being led by the evidence and that they have this high regard for uh, the scientific method, you know, being diligent and, um, you know, aggressively careful and all of this, but not really. And this video demonstrates it. So it's titled, The Nine Experiments That Will Change Your View of Light. Now, I don't think we're going to bother with all those. And blow your mind uh, by something called Astrum. Kind of an annoying video. Um, sounds like religion, frankly. Um, anyway, yeah. Um, so we'll play some of this, and then maybe some Degrassi Tyson on photons. But it's just got all the standard mm, bullshit lines in it. It's made up of tiny little particles that he called corpuscles. He didn't call them corpuscles. He called them corpuscular. <laughs> but anyway. But in 1801, nearly 100 years later, a man named Thomas Young discovered that light must actually be more wave-like than... All right, so he didn't actually discover anything Newton didn't already discover. So let's understand Newton did the single slit, okay, and he did the single impediment. So he did the outside surface pattern and the inside surface pattern. And the double slit is just a combination of those two. So it's not a huge big surprise. He didn't observe anything new. You can see from these drawings themselves how crude they are. Okay, they're, um, it's not monochromatic light. Um, you know, the pattern is basically a single slit pattern and, um, you know, being interpreted as a double slit pattern because he's using very narrow slits. Okay, so I guess we have to already, okay, pause and do a little bit of background. All right, so back. Um, so yes, if you did a single impediment or you did a single slit and the light presumably you know, it went through the slit. And in this case, you can sort of understand that automatically you're doing something a little bit strange because obviously there's light on the right and the left. It's not just going through. And you also get a pattern here. Okay. Um, and the real key is it's just number of surfaces. There's two surfaces here, there's two surfaces here, and in the double slit experiment there's four surfaces, which is the big difference. Now as you can see from Young's drawing, well, you could see before in the video, um, he doesn't account, he doesn't see the real double slit pattern. So the real double slit pattern has a unique feature in the sense that it has little, little nodes and uh, a larger envelope pattern. And the little bars are all the same size, okay, and the envelope pattern incorporates what was in the single slit pattern that isn't in wave patterns. So water waves don't make a double maxima here in the center. But as you can see from Young's drawing, he doesn't quite have it quite right. Well, you can't see it. Uh, but he does recognize the bigger pattern here in the middle. Um, and that doesn't happen with water waves. So there are features that say it's not about water. It's not about waves. Okay, and so the simple solution to the problem is it's just about surfaces. And so essentially the light's coming in as photons. And on the surfaces are electrons. And the electrons are deflecting the light that goes near a surface in the sense that part of the light is being hit. And it is deflected and it can be deflected in any of numerous directions and the fact is it's just scattered and then the scatter is sent to the wall or the observing surface and you have a 50 50 chance of it being in phase or out of phase and so it sort of always was a phase pattern it's not an interference pattern it's a phase pattern it's just telling you that there's places where the reconstructed photons will be in phase in places where they can't be in phase from these locations. So these are essentially point sources. And the simple fact is, is if I take point sources, I make them very close together, two headlights, and I put them far enough away, you can't see the two headlights anymore. And so if I make these two surfaces too close together, I essentially just create two point sources. 
array from here and array from here or a bit from here and a bit from here won't be able to travel a wavelength of difference no matter where I draw the line to. There's no way to make the two lines longer and shorter than each other by a wavelength because there is no wavelength of difference in their distance. So if you don't have a wavelength of difference in this part of the triangle, you can't make a wavelength of difference in either one of these sides. So you, could, you can't make a place where there's a wavelength of difference. And so the simple truth is, is if you do the experiment with slits that are open, that is large separation, uh, half a millimeter, quarter of a millimeter, uh, eighth of a millimeter, some kind of reasonable slit opening, then you will get this more complex pattern. And the more complex pattern will have um, features that you can dissect. That is, you can predict what the features will look like. So if you take the widest distance between two point sources, that is this distance and this distance, that's the furthest two surfaces are from each other, that decides how small these little dots will be on the screen. And the shortest distance between two surfaces, let's just say it's this line and this line, that will decide what this envelope pattern does. Um, because it's really just about distances from points and the fact that this triangle, you're just building a triangle with the distance. And the fact is, is the bigger the distance, the more this side gets bigger and smaller than this side by a wavelength, the more notches you can put on it. So essentially, the number of wavelengths in this distance, let's say the distance between the two outside surfaces, a lot of wavelengths can fit in there. Therefore, for every one of these lines, these wavelengths, there's another place where they're in phase. And so it's really just telling you how many of these there will be. And so whatever this is, you have it that much going this way, and then that much going this way. There's two different patterns, one, one created by one side, one created by the other side, controlled by. And so that's why you have this larger central maxima, is because you're really not starting from the same zero point. You're starting from this location and this location, and then making a curve. So, um, yeah, it's all dissectable, and it's all dissectable as vectors where energy goes, and the energy recreates, like I said. So the photon, as Einstein described it, he called them light quanta, um, and he sort of did imply that it was more than one of them made a photon, and that's the simple solution. So if you understand that a photon is a sequence of events, and so you're basically throwing tennis balls at something, and they have to hit with a certain frequency, and so this explains the photoelectric effect, because you can sort of understand that if I wanted to tip something over, or I wanted to give an electron momentum, uh, the faster I hit it, the more likely it is the energy is going to be positive. That is, the more likely this thing isn't going to tilt back the other way. So if I hit an electron with some energy, and it moves, but it's being pulled back by a proton, so it's going to tend to pull back, you could understand that the, if I hit it again quickly, it doesn't pull back as much. So now I'm adding more and more energy to it. So if I can hit it before it tilts back, then I'm always adding energy to its resident frequency. Uh, and um, I have a better likelihood of tipping it over. So that explains the photoelectric effect, why frequency matters. It's not more energy. It's, it's energy applied more efficiently. So if you apply the energy slowly, it can't tip anything over, right? So if you had something to tip over and you threw a rock at it every half hour, not going to tip over ever. But if you throw the rocks every three seconds, then you got a good chance of tipping it over. That kind of thing. So it's just that the tipping point argument explains the photoelectric effect and explains why the photon frequency increases the energy. So even though the quanta themselves, the little bits, have exactly the same energy, they're just a piece of mass moving the speed of light, so they all have the same energy. If you throw them at a surface quicker, you're more likely to disrupt the th surface, is the simple argument. Throwing rocks quicker makes the rocks more effective. 
throwing them slower makes them less effective. It's even if you're going to shoot somebody, right? And you shot them with one bullet and it didn't kill them. They went to the hospital, got fixed, and you shot them again three weeks later. And they went to the hospital and got fixed. You know, you're not killing them. But if you shoot them all the bullets at once, then they're dead. It's that kind of thing. Lots of ways to understand it. That's the <clears throat> semi-short version of how it could have all been interpreted. And instead, they decided to turn it into this mushy description of wave particle duality mush and none of it was necessary because there was an explanation that was more reasonable and they just didn't think of it and because they didn't think about it they thought well we're really smart we know everything so if we didn't think of it somehow it can't exist uh, and it just shows the arrogance of physics they drew way too premature a conclusion. Particle-like. He proved this using an important method known... So he didn't prove anything. Let's just understand. He didn't prove any conclusions about photons. And he demonstrated a function that Newton had already observed pretty much. Fringe patterns were already an observed known fact. Not a surprise. And it still needed an explanation. And his explanation, in, and frankly, isn't very accurate. As the double slit experiment. So uh, let's understand what he was viewing was a single slit pattern because he made the slits very narrow. He set up a source of light and shone it through two narrow slits onto a board. So it's not that they're just narrow, they're less than a few wavelengths of light, meaning they're going to create very few bars. So if it's, if it's less than a wavelength, it can't create any fringe pattern because there can't be any wavelength of difference from the two locations. The two locations are so close to each other that the two point sources can't create a fringe pattern. Young noticed that rather than getting two bands of light on the other side of the slits, a strange striped pattern was forming. All right, and so again, Newton had already done these experiments, so there's nothing strange about it. This was known as an interference pattern. Right, and it's really just a phase, out of phase pattern. So you're really just saying it's in phase, it's out of phase. So in radar experiments or radio experiments, you would just call this jamming. There's places where the signal is jammed because the photons are out of sequence and places where you can receive the signal because they're in phase. The two signals have the same um, register, starting node point. They have a co common reference. If the two signals have an uncommon reference, the receiver can't distinguish between the two. He can't tell which signal is which. Uh, but if they have a common reference, then it can see both signals. And was incontrovertible proof. So incontrovertible proof. It wasn't any of those things. So this is just nonsense. Light had been traveling as a wave. Science shouldn't have said that. They shouldn't have thought that. They shouldn't have done any of that. It's just not the truth. Why? Let's talk about waves for a moment. So this is the fall for something that doesn't have anything to do with it. So the mechanism that makes water rise and fall, okay, doesn't really have anything to do with an interference of water molecules. It has to do with the fact that the water is a slow medium, so whenever you have pressure in it, the pressure doesn't have anywhere to go because the molecules don't want to. You have to push all the molecules to push any of them. You want to push a water molecule, you end up having to push all the ones it's connected to. So pressure doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just builds up. And so the fact is, is the atmosphere doesn't weigh as much as the pressure of the water. The water is heavier than the atmosphere. And so the pressure, instead of trying to go this way, it goes this way. And then once it goes up, it goes up high enough where it starts to create more pressure from gravity. And so now it can push back down into the higher pressure because it gained pressure from gravity. And so it just does this motion. Yeah. And photons aren't doing anything like that.
When waves travel, they oscillate up and down. But when two waves try to oscillate the same point in space at the same time, you get something known as interference. Imagine you... Waves are the product of complex um, action inside of a medium of things that are interconnected. So they, they don't happen this way. They don't just happen. Something doesn't just wave. It has to be causing by some other mechanism. And the very idea that in empty space there's some mechanism, okay, some ether, that uh, somehow has this magnetic and electric function when it's billions of miles from any gravitational or magnetic source, that it's traveling without any matter anywhere near it. Um, what is this function? So there's no explanation. It's like, you know, the very idea that whatever this field is, that it somehow it permeates everything. Um, no, space permeates everything. Uh, and the, whatever the field is, it has to be made out of something that's moving, that has energy. Because the effect is always to transfer some element of momentum to make something move. It makes stuff move. It has to be stuff to make stuff move. I had a bathtub with a rubber duck sitting on the surface. Two waves reach the duck at once. One wave tries to raise the duck up. At the so again, this is, you could find lots of analogies where you're just saying something has a character where it has upness or downness or sidewaysness or some sort of ness. And the two nesses are opposite and you could understand that they would do some sort of combining or canceling. But it's not what photons are doing. They're, it's phase. The photons are just in phase, out of phase, the sequence of bullets. And if they're out of phase, they won't have the same effect as if they're in phase. And that's the simple argument. At the exact same time, the other wave tries to drop it down. What happens? Provided the waves are of the same magnitude and are perfectly out of phase, they will cancel each other out. So again, this perfect thing is clearly not part of what photons are doing either. So obviously the pattern ends up being more light than dark. The dark bands are smaller than the light bands, um, meaning that they don't have to be perfectly in phase to make a photon. They just have to be close enough, some range that's um, close enough to in phase. And then there's some range that's out of phase. And the duck would not move at all. This is called destructive interference. <clears throat> Similarly, and again, it's not what's happening. There's nothing being destroyed, and the, frankly, there's nothing interfering. So this is another experiment you can do where you know they can have verification in the sense that they can do the experiment in ways where the two sources are opposite each other. So if they were waves. The waves can't interfere because they're going to a central antenna. And all I have to do is move the antenna in that field, and I can just put them in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, and it has absolutely nothing to do with them interacting in space. They're not traveling through space and interfering with each other. So there is no interference. Whatever does happen, the phenomenon, it happens at the surface. When they hit the surface, they're either in phase are out of phase when they hit the surface. They don't destroy each other before they get to the surface and they don't combine or add before they get to the surface. It's just about how they're hitting the surface, the timing at the surface. Did they hit the surface going bang, bang, bang with the right period or frequency or did they hit it out of phase, bang, bang, bang? If the waves both tried to raise the duck up at the same time, the duck would be raised twice as high. This is known... So again, this doesn't happen with light. Light doesn't get twice as bright and half, you know, no bright. <laughs> None of that's happening. So that's all just canard. Um, there's no evidence that light's turning on and off. So uh, the same location, if it was waves of water, the same location be going up and down. It would be going twice as high and then twice as low and twice as high and twice as low. Light isn't doing that. Can't get twice as dark. As constructive interference. 
Because waves tend to expand in a circle, two waves next to each other will start to both construct. Right, but a single wave won't won't interfere with itself. So again, the single the single source won't create any of this pattern. A single slit drawn with water waves will not produce any fringe pattern. So it's just kind of again nonsense. And this two source is creating a single slit pattern. It's not creating the complex double slit pattern. You need four sources to create the double slit pattern. So it's just a canard. Again, it's about surfaces. Surfaces are the key to the, all these experiments. It's about photons interacting with the surfaces. So there's the two surface experiment and there's the four surface experiment. And then you can go to six or 10 or 12 or 15 surfaces, but it's always about the surfaces. Destructively and destructively interfere with each other. Here are two waves in water. See these lines? Right, so you have no double maxima here in the center. Big, huge feature missing. You only have two sources which are sort of duplicating the two surfaces of a single slit. This would be one source shooting photons. You know, they're hitting the electrons being shot in random directions. Hitting electrons, sh they're not random. I mean, electrons are moving in and out of the surface. So it's either going to be deflected this way or this way. It's not going to be deflected up, down. It's not going to be deflected some other way. It's going to be left or right because the electron is either moving out or it's moving back into the surface. And so that's why the pattern spreads in one dimension. But these two zeros they have here aren't the openings of the double slit pattern. They could be understood as being the surfaces of a single slit pattern. And that's what this is, a single slit pattern. Except it's missing the double maxima created by photons that isn't created by water waves. These karma patches are where the waves are cancelling each other out. This is the effect we see with light traveling through two slits. As the light from one slit propagates, it cancels out the other wave of light. So again, it's about in the two slits, it's about four surfaces. So there should be four point sources here. And the four point sources are all making a contribution. So when there's a, when there's a, <coughs> a full wavelength of difference, uh, going to a location from all four points then you have a visible photon when it's just two it's not enough when two of the surfaces match or two of the other surfaces match so you have to have all four in phase and then you get a dot of visible light and if all four aren't in phase you don't get a photon at certain points you don't get a you don't get enough photons to make a bright enough signal creating the interference pattern that Young noticed on the board. So the mystery was solved. So again, it isn't a solution. It didn't fit in the first place. They just stretched it and forced it to fit. So this is square peg in the round scientific hole. They already had reason not to believe it. And they just didn't want to see those reasons. I mean, ignoring the fact that the features don't match isn't very scientific. Light was a wave and not a particle, except there is more to this experiment than meets the eye. Let's fast forward another 100 years to 1905. Scientists around this time had become puzzled by something known as the photoelectric effect. It turned out that when you shone a light on a metal surface, electron-like particles were coming off it. This was deduced to be... be uh, I don't know what electron light particles, so it's just electrons, but whatever. Because electrons in the metal were getting knocked off it by the increased energy the light was imparting. So again, it, the simple solution is it's not about an increase in the energy, it's, a, an, it's a, about distributing the energy more efficiently. So again, the simple explanation is the tipping point explanation. Or rocking the boat or you know you could use lots of explanations now they use some idea that the electrons trapped in a hole and it needs a certain amount of energy to push it out well even that explanation can be understood that if I did have a a bowl and I 
pushed an electron and it's rolled up one side and then came back down the other side and then it was rolling the right way again I hit it again while it's rolling in the right direction I'm going to add to its velocity and now it's going to increase its velocity and as long as I don't hit it when it's rolling against the photon then I'll just keep adding energy and I can get the electron out of the bowl so even using their analogy you can understand it as a resident frequency argument yeah, you could understand that if you want to add energy to a kid on a swing you have to push them when they're moving in the direction you're going to push if you push them when they're moving in the opposite direction you're going to destroy okay your capacity to add energy imagine it like a fruit on a tree so this is a really bad analogy and again you can imagine that you know if you gave it some momentum that you could just sit there and say this is like shaking the tree and once I get the tree to a high enough velocity a whole bunch of apples will fall off but I can't get to a high high velocity unless I rock the tree by pushing when the trees moving in the direction I'm pushing it's like getting a car out of the mud you have to push when the cars moving in the direction you're pushing if you pull the fruit off the tree you need to use a certain amount of energy once the energy is greater than the strength of the fruit's connection to the branch, the fruit pops off. So it's just not that simple. Now the real truth is, is that the photons don't hit one electron. What they're basically doing is hitting one atom with its electron. So they hit an electron in one atom. When they hit that electron, that atom essentially expands because all the electrons in that atom are disrupted by the added pressure. So you've pressurized the atom and sort of expanded it. And that expansion goes to the next atom and the next atom. So all the electrons are really what's holding the structure. The tension in any matter is the tension between the protons and the electrons. So they're all magnetically held. And you can just understand you poke one magnet, you poked all the magnets. And so essentially the, the energy from that poke you gave that one electron is now moving through the matter, through the atoms. And what you're essentially going to do now is hit another electron that's moving. So you already gave it momentum with the first hit. This is a different electron now that's going to move a little bit. You're going to hit it again and increase its speed. So where the first electron went 50 miles an hour, now it's going to be going 70 miles an hour, but you're going to hit it again. While it's still going 30, you're going to hit it again and knock it up to 70. And then you're going to get it up to 90. And let's say 90 is the speed at which the electron leaves the atom. So three hits, you could say. So a photon could be two elements. You have to have at least two to have a frequency, obviously. Could be three elements, could be four. Um, but some number of bits that have to hit in the right sequence to keep pushing the electrons. And the right sequence is dependent on the speed of the electrons in the substance. So every substance has a different number of electrons, a different number of distances away from each other. So you can understand in one atom, the electrons are going to be 50 miles from each other. In another atom, they're going to be 10 miles from each other. Depending on how far apart they are will depend on what frequency of light is able to release an electron. And the thing metals have in common is a range of frequencies. But each metal has its own... Each metal tells you, okay, that this frequency thing matters because each metal will start knocking electrons out at a different frequency. They'll all be in the ultraviolet range, but it'll be a different um, exact um, blueness of the light uh, for each metal. This was happening with the light and the electrons. Once the light hit an electron and gave it enough energy to pass the threshold, it broke free from the metal. However, So again, it's really not uh, just a threshold. It's not that you're just knocking something off a stick. It really is about timing and the frequency is the timing and that's why all of this is frequency dependent. The tipping requires a frequent, a specific frequency. If you don't throw the, the if you're trying to tip over a stick, an obelisk, there's a frequency that it moves at. 
and you have to throw the energy at that frequency. Okay. What's the prize sign? Uh, obviously, the faster the frequency just means that you're, you tip it a little, and then you tip it, and then you tip it, and you don't allow it ever to go back. So obviously, fast frequencies are automatically going to work because they don't provide any opportunity to go back. Where something like red light is, the, the, the period is long enough that it does start to go back. So you have a harder and harder time adding energy because it's already going backward. This was that if you increased the intensity of the light, they had expected the electrons to be knocked away faster. So more light doesn't solve the problem. So throwing more rocks at the wrong frequency won't knock the obelisk over. And it's just throwing the right number of rocks at the right frequency will. So it's not about the photons having blue light having more energy quanta. It doesn't have more energy quanta. It just has more in a smaller period of time. It delivers more in a smaller period of time, and that's what makes it more effective in moving electrons. If you pull the fruit off the tree harder, it would come off faster. More energy equals more departure. So that isn't even a good analogy. You're talking about, like, let's say you were throwing sand at the tree and trying to knock down apples. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or, or rocks. Throwing more rocks won't work if what you really have to do is get the apple to rock before it flies off. So if you have to get the apple to swing, throwing more rocks won't work. In kinetic energy. However, this did not appear to be the case. Instead, increasing the frequency of the light increased the velocity of the departing electrons. So <clears throat> it's, it doesn't, it obviously only increases the velocity incidentally because you're increasing the amount of energy you're delivering in a shorter period of time, which means you're delivering more energy because you're not losing any to drag. You're not letting it slow down. So it's like wind. You could blow wind on a sail and then stop for a second and then blow for a second and then stop for a second. Well, if you could fill those gaps with wind, you'd end up having a higher velocity. It wouldn't be that each puff was more air. It just means that you put more puffs in a shorter distance and therefore you more efficiently produce the velocity. The boat never slowed down. The intensity of the light didn't affect the departing electron's velocity at all, but did affect the quantity of electrons being emitted. It was a bit of a puzzler. Albert Einstein was the man... So there's no puzzle in understanding that, yes, if you deliver the light faster and faster, the more likely you are to tip something. So if you want to defeat the whole tipping, you know, if you want to defeat the whole swing problem, you know, where it goes back the other way, well, just throw your rocks fast enough where it never tips back. <laughs> then you're guaranteed to knock it over. So if you get the frequency high enough <clears throat> where you never allow it to tip back, then you're guaranteed the, uh, to knock it over, to add the velocity. Always add velocity. Who solved the puzzle? He deduced that light must be traveling in little packets of energy. So sending more of them, increasing the frequency, was the only way to increase the energy going to... So again, the, the packets would be the quanta, the light quanta, he called it. So the light quanta, you can't just increase the amount of quanta. You have to increase the period in which the quanta is delivered. So it's how often a quanta hits that matters, not how many hit. It's the speed between that matters. There's no other way to say that. It's a tipping point argument. The electrons. He called these packets photons and later earned a Nobel Prize for his work. Light, it seemed, was more like a particle again. Or both, a wave and a particle at once. So that's a concession they finally dragged out of Einstein, um, you know, by, I guess, the... 20s or 30s uh, because um, 
You know, Einstein was basically saying, no, we haven't finished. We've got an incomplete theory. And he was sort of dragged to be obliged to puppet these words that it's uh, somehow a wave and a particle because they hadn't finished figuring out what it was. Um, and it's it's just that nonsensical. You don't decide it's you know neither black or white. We know it's one or the other. It's, it's left or it's right. There is no left right. Of course, even this is not the full picture. To be honest, we aren't completely sure about the full picture even now. Instead, we have more results. So why do you keep mimicking the, this rhetoric that uh, you know Young proved? Um, when why don't you shouldn't just what you should be saying? Well, even now we finally realize that they never did this elemental physics really completely, and that we shouldn't have drawn any conclusions, and that we should still be pursuing a better answer. That's what you should be saying: is we should be pursuing a better answer and not drawing conclusions that it's nail in the coffin evidence or it's been proven it's a wave. And it hasn't been that are contradictory. Let's go back to the double slit experiment. Armed with the knowledge of photons, physicists once again took a look at the double slit experiment. So and again they still don't understand that it's not the double slit experiment, it's the four surface experiment. You have four point sources. So the surfaces can just be understood as point sources. They're new point sources. So the photon goes in, the ones by the surfaces get disrupted and now become little new flashlights. Flashlights are going to produce light in a new pattern. Okay, And um, those four s point sources are what decide what the pattern are going to be. Experimental techniques had improved in the last 100 years and it was now possible to emit a single photon of light at a time. So that's just a lie. So there's no element to this experiment how it's done. They don't emit single photons. They always use filters. So they did that back in 17 something or other, early 1800s maybe, um, you know, where they used a gas light uh, and they uh, put a bunch of black filters in front of it to reduce how many photons get through. And then they put it in a box and just left it there for a month. Okay, so there's a light bulb, a really opaque uh, filters, and then a photographic paper. And they did that experiment right in the beginning of the invention of photographic paper um, uh, emulsions. And um, so they had already done the, this experiment. And the trick is, I guess I'll draw this part because it really is important, um, that they're not really producing single photons. They're, you know, it's it's just not true. They're producing an effect that looks like there's only single photons because that's all they can see are the single photons, but they're not seeing the actual places where the photons are coming from. And it's a really important um, feature. All right, so what kind of has to be understood is, is <coughs> oh, so they have this little source of light. Okay, all right. And so what they're doing is they're putting a filters in, okay, opacancy. And what the opacancy basically is, is a bunch of little slits, right? I mean, it's a bunch of little dark bits of crap in a substance, okay? And the idea is, is that it's a bunch of little slits, okay? What's really happening is, is the photons hitting surfaces all over the place, and the pieces are getting disrupted and bent and scattered. So you're scattering the light. So as the light's going through, all the photons are getting scattered. So at all these points, the light's changing direction. The single bits of the photon that were, you know, sort of orderly, all going the same way. Well, one of them went this way, one of them went that way, a piece went this way, a piece went that way. So they went all kinds of different directions. So what you have coming out is still a whole bunch of these little bits. It's just that they're scattered in all directions up, down, left, right, all over the place. So you have a place way down here that you could have a piece coming from. You could have a piece coming from over here. You could have a piece come from over here. And the fact is that inevitably on the surface, now it's not going to be 50-50, but some percentage of all these little bits that finally get through, some percentage of the little bits that don't have their momentum absorbed 
through heat. You know, when the light's going through the opaque filters, it's heating the filters. Um, and there's only a certain amount, you know, maybe, uh, you know, one in a hundred, okay? Maybe one in a hundred of the little bits gets through the filter. And so you have all those little bits coming through and there's some percentage of them that all just happen to have the right timing when they hit the surface. So one comes from over here, one comes from over here, one comes from over here, and it recreates the period necessary hitting the surface in the right location, and it makes a photon. So there was plenty of energy in the system. There's plenty of, of pieces of photon flying and hitting the surface. It's just only a tiny number of them end up recreating the necessary period and frequency, uh, polarization and frequency. I mean, polarization is basically the idea that the, the bits are flying in parallel to each other. So there is a, a, um, a polarization this way, okay, as they're traveling this way. So that it needs to be understood that when they say it's a single photon at a time, no, they're just breaking a bunch of photons and they're just remaking very few at the target. So the double slit experiment was done again. This time, only a single photon would be sent through the slit onto a detector on the far side. When this was done, the detector registered the arrival of the photon at just a single point. So, light was... So there was still more than one photon going through, more than one piece of a photon going through both slits. So this, the both point sources were still in the game. So even though the number of pieces was reduced, there was still a bunch of pieces hitting the two slits. And there was still a bunch of pieces that were being deflected by the two slits and remaking photons. Behaving like a particle again. But then, why had it interfered with itself in the previous version of the experiment? Scientists had... I mean, they just imply that they have a gun that just fires one photon, and a gun fires one photon. All of the experiments are done with filters. And you can understand what is the filter. The filter is just a maze of slit experiment surfaces. The filter is just a ton of surfaces put in the way of the photon. It just scatters the crap out of the photon. An idea. They sent through multiple photons, one at a time. So it's not one at a time. So it, it's just, this is all just deception. They don't have any such gun. They never did it with any such gun, okay? <laughs> they did it with filters, always plotted the result on the detector. And this is where the result became really strange. Once again, the detector started seeing the photons arriving. Yes, because there's still four surfaces and there's still a bunch of uh, energy quanta hitting those two surfaces and creating potentially a photon. At single points, one at a time, but bafflingly, the arriving photons started creating a pattern. It was the interference pattern. The proof that light behaved like a wave. But strange. So again, it's the phase pattern and it doesn't produce uh, anything. It, there's no reason to conclude it's a wave pattern. It's an on-off pattern. It's the simplest pattern nature can create on-off. It shouldn't be declared to be always has to be the product of some sort of interference. Usually enough, this was only occurring when a single photon was going through at a time. Some so that wasn't happening. What's happening is a bunch of pieces thrown at the two slits. There's still pieces going through the two slits at the same time. Those pieces create a photon. Those are the facts. How the single photon which was leaving the detector like a particle and was arriving at its destination as a particle was apparently in some way traveling through both slits. Of so a preposterously silly conclusion. I mean, they should have ruled that out right from the start. Too silly, nonsensical. There's got to be a better explanation. 
And all they really had to do was widen these slits, and they would have seen that, oh, wait a minute, there's an envelope pattern. This is more complex. This is really about distances between surfaces. And if it's about distances between surfaces, then you can essentially say it's about distances between point sources. The surfaces are a new point source. Once enough to then interfere with itself on the other side like a wave. So nothing interferes. And again, if I do this experiment the other way around, where instead of two slits, I have two sources opposite each other, I'll get the same interference pattern, okay, <laughs> the same fringe pattern, um, and the two sources never inter in interact with each other. If light was just a particle, then when it went through the slits, you wouldn't see this pattern. You would only see two blocks. So we already knew, Newton already knew that wasn't true. So we already knew that whatever light is, yeah, you're not going to get two clumps of it because the surfaces are going to deflect. All the light that goes near a surface is going to get screwed up. And it's so obvious. I mean, they can see it happening. You increase, you know, the, uh, the round aperture. You, Newton did this experiment too. You know, you make the aperture smaller and smaller and the pattern gets bolder and bolder. And why? Because the smaller you make the aperture, the higher the number of photons that are near a surface. The bigger the aperture, the, f the pattern is completely washed out because most of the photons just fly right through this giant aperture. So all of this fringe stuff is going to get lost. But if um, you know, I make the aperture smaller and smaller, I make the hole smaller and smaller, the number of photons near a surface goes way up. So the smaller I make the hole, the more likely it is every single photon will be you know, um, uh, a fringe photon. Lots of light, one for particles that went through the slit and one for particles that went through the other one. And yet, here was the interference pattern with its multiple lines of light disproving that. So again, more of this multiple lines of light. It's not as simple as multiple lines of light. It's obviously a pattern, and the pattern in the double slit isn't honestly represented as on, off, on, off, on, off because of the envelope pattern. There's clearly uh, two patterns in the true double slit pattern. Scientists tried to pin light down. They set up the experiment, but this time with two more detectors at the All right, so there's no, this never happens, so this is just where it really goes off the rails. There's no such thing as a photon detector experiment. So, I mean, I maybe would just stop here because that's just such a pile of made up rubbish. Slit so that scientists could observe whether it was indeed passing through both at the same time. It didn't. But at the same time, it stopped creating an interference pattern. So none of this happened. This is all just surmised that obviously if you could detect the photons and you could, duh, 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 that there wouldn't be a pattern. Yes, because there wouldn't be any way to create the interference, obviously. So this is just what they deduced would have happened if they could detect. They never did any. You can't detect photons passively. On the furthermost detector. And from this, scientists began to realize something. Light cared about being observed. All right, so this is really just now religious wooey nonsense. So I didn't know this was going to be that bad. But yes, now we've gone into the wooville of Dr. Quantum and bullshit. So the video has 428,000 views, 11,000 thumbs up, and it's apparently a bunch of religious crap. <laughs> okay, so too terrible. Uh, you know, I guess I'll have to read some of the comments. Uh, but you know, this is just this is just where they start just making absolute bullshit up. Photons don't need to be observed. They're momentum. They crash into a surface and they cause electrons to move. When the electrons move, it's called electricity, and we can detect that. That's how photons work. When they hit the back of your eye, 
they basically create an electric current that goes through your to your brain. To be clear, it didn't matter whether it was observed by a human eye or a machine. The moment light was interacted with in some way by any particle. Well, so again, it's just in some way, then you could argue that gravity is interacting with it all the time and they can never escape gravity or each other. So why don't they interact all the time? Why doesn't a laser beam crash into a laser beam? So this theory is just absolute nonsense, this interaction theory. Um, you know, that it's a collapsing wave function nonsense. There's no such opportunity in reality. In reality, the camera is always on. Gravity is always on. The electromagnetic spectrum, I mean, I'm being hit by the light from bazillions and trillions of stars that are out there. And photons from all those bazillions and trillions of stars are hitting me all the time. I, there's no place where it's truly dark which is the only way we can detect light. There's no other way to observe it. It started behaving differently than if it hadn't been. So you can't observe it. You can just watch. You can just detect where it terminates because it creates a momentum event. And that's it. Detected at all. It was if light was snapping into focus any time the universe asked it the question of where exactly it was. All right, so this goes to Heisenberg and all that crap. You don't need any of that nonsense as a backdrop for this simple... If the function is really simple, and now they're making the function into something quite wooey. It's an on-off pattern, frankly. It's a phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase, in phase pattern. Why do we need all this nonsense? when without the scrutiny, it appeared to relax into something a little more nebulous. Bizarrely enough, to me, this seems to imply that light actually is more like a wave of probability rather than no, any discrete no. part. That's the Feynman theory anyway. Um, but again, just nonsense. You don't need any of that. And clearly it's not about probability because why does the pattern spread? You have two vertical slits and the pattern spreads horizontally. Isn't that giving you sort of a giveaway that it's the nature of the surface that decides where the randomness happens? The fringe pattern with the two slits don't go everywhere. The fringe pattern goes quite obviously. 99% of the light goes in this horizontal plane. Um, clearly obedient to the physical structure it hit. There's no randomness in that. It doesn't pick a random direction to go. So why is it not? I mean, you can't say it's random when it doesn't have, when it's not randomly vertical. It's only randomly horizontal. Come on. Why, if it was random, why wouldn't it randomly go up or down? Clearly it's not, there's something else controlling the function. And obviously the function's being controlled by the electrons on the surface that are moving in and out of the surface. <laughs> That's what's causing the horizontal function. Article or wave. Anytime it was asked... And it doesn't matter if I turn those slits sideways this way, then I'm going to get the pattern up and down. So it's not about gravity. It's not about some other force. It's about those surfaces. The configuration of the surfaces is dictating the pattern, and it is not anything like random. It's quite controlled where it was, it confidently provided a definitive answer. It was at this point on the detector. It was not at any other point. But with no one checking up on it, light seems to be traveling in all directions at once. In a so again, there's no checking up on it. There's no detecting it. It either goes and it hits the surface. It either has the right phase and the right frequency or it doesn't. That's all there is with certain probabilities if you you either deliver the energy and at the resident frequency of the atoms or you don't if you're off the atoms residency that is the time it takes for the electron energy to move from atom to atom if you're off of that then you're not going to have a photon you're not going to create electricity you ran the experiment multiple times you could quantify those. And it's the same rules for the reflections. So just understand that reflections are
basically just the recreation of the photon. That is, the event doesn't last, okay, inside the material. And the electron basically at the same speed it was got pushed in originally, it pushes out. So you're really just saying you did a little bit of electricity for a little distance and then you've just shot it back out again. So the photons there, are, there's two kinds of photons, the one that reflects and the ones that are absorbed. And they're not even talking about the absorbed photons. Probabilities. Discovering that it was more likely to be on the bands of the interference pattern and less likely to be in the gaps. I mean, obviously, if you if you project the double slit onto a black surface, it's a much darker pattern, okay, <laughs> because much more of the photons are absorbed and they don't reflect back to your eyes. But any time a single photon of light was asked, it gave an answer that was 100% concrete. <clears throat> yes, there is or is, there is or is or isn't. Um, and the fact is, is what decides is or isn't are the dimensions of the disrupting surfaces. The surfaces are what's causing the disruption that's causing the scatter to happen in the horizontal plane. And that's all it is, scatter. This is highlighted through something known as the three polarizer paradox. All right, so we won't do this. I've already done a video on this. There's no paradox involved. And again, it's all about understanding that all of these... Consider for a moment... None of these polarizers are absorbing the light. And all they're doing is changing its phase. That is the time it goes through the material. And so they're just putting light in phase and out of phase. And that's all they're doing. And so obviously if you, <clears throat> if you create a phase difference between the photon, it's a broken photon, and then you can just stick another filter in and restore the phase. But that's all you did with the two filters was break the phase, and then you just restore it by putting a third filter in. All right. But anyway, we won't go into all that. All right, so just horrible. But they're all horrible. Every single video made about photons is horrible. I am the only person who's made a good rational video about a photon. So if you're listening to this video, you're one of the few people that actually heard the right theory. And all the other mush is just that mush. And as I demonstrate in this argument, I demonstrate how it's mush because they jump to these silly conclusions way too prematurely and they just didn't think about it very hard. I mean, the tipping point argument is so good and to think that none of these scientists thought of it is almost... Oh, come on. It's such an obvious answer that you, you can't add energy. <laughs> if timing is wrong, you can't add energy. There's lots of systems we know. If the timing's wrong, you can't add energy to the system. I mean, uh, you know, just hitting a ball on a tether. Uh, all kinds of things. You have to add the energy at the right time. You have to hit the ball at the right time. If you don't hit the right time, you're not going to add energy. There's just so many spinning a wheel on an axle. I mean, there's so many examples where you have to add the energy at the right timing. All right, anyway, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot. I guess a wheel wouldn't be a good example. A bunch of sticks, you know, on a bearing. Because then you'd have to be able to hit the stick. You can't hit the air behind the stick. You have to actually hit the stick. All right. Hitting the pedal on a bicycle. Say if you will, you know, sometimes just for fun, I'll, I'll, when I'm on a bicycle, I'll try to pedal with one foot just by pushing in partially and so you know the pedal spinning and I try to hit it right when it's going down I hit it right when it's going down just to pump energy in um, that kind of thing and so it's just all about the timing being correct or you're not going to add energy all right so till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot you know I'll do the Degrassi Tyson as a separate video probably just end up going over some of the same stuff but it can't hurt to keep going over it because frankly 
I, I don't know. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? I mean, I can give you a rational diagram. I mean, I can explain to you why there's little dots, you know, um, why, why there's a pattern inside the pattern. I can explain to you the small fringes and the large, you know, envelope pattern. I can explain all of that. Every feature of it, I can explain exactly why it happens. They don't come anywhere close. So it's, you know, it's just sad that, you know, the truth is just something you will not discover, you know, but you're not really looking for it. Uh, the world doesn't want right answers. It just wants to do this propaganda for nonsense. Uh, sorry if I didn't have the video on. I guess you heard it. Yeah, that's disappointing. I mean, it wasn't. You weren't missing anything. The graphics were the standard Doctor Quantum style graphics. But yeah, sorry about that. Anyway, till the next time and such, and so forth and whatnot.